All right, good afternoon once again. Number 111 in your red book. 111, if you want to hold that after the message. Give me a minute here, see if I can get my electronic tool working. Have you ever had these things go weird on you? <laughs> there it is. I, I try to uh, depend on it, but sometimes they sort of throw me a loop for some reason. But usually it's me. I'm not putting in the right things, and I found that out too. All right, very good. Got it going here now. Last night we started the message on this series of Overcoming the World, and we're taking the message from uh, 1 John uh, chapter 5. And uh, verses 4 and 5 there where it speaks to us about overcoming the world. And there's two things there that I wanted to direct our attention back to because it's going to apply to us. And I'm going to be stressing them uh, throughout this series. And we find there that the victory of the world comes by what? First of all, what is the victory over the world? Overcomes the world? Our faith. And then he goes on and state that Jesus Christ, also our belief in the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So just as those two facts is the foundation of everything that we looked at uh, last night and uh, where that will take care of the cares of the world, we're also going to find that this also is the foundation, an act of faith, and also actually trusting in who Jesus is, they're going to be in the foundation of what we're going to be looking at tonight as well. So we're basically posing the question. The scripture speaks a lot about being victorious. And we find that thought of being victorious within the word of being overcomers, what the scripture tells us that we are to overcome. We start with overcoming the world. And now I'm just sort of want to try to break it down to help us to see what is involved in overcoming the world. Because that is sort of a general term that takes in everything. But we can't consider everything at once. If you're like me, I need to take it piece by piece, part by part. Uh, take it separately and then bringing all of it together to understand what it means by overcoming the world. So last night we looked at the cares of the world, the effects of the world, how it can cause the word of God to become ineffective within us. And then we more so was looking at how we can overcome that. And basically it came down to we're going to have to activate our faith in Jesus Christ. And that's the only way or, the, or the, really the foundation that that's going to happen. What I want to look at tonight is also a part of overcoming the world. And this is sort of probably more so the beginning, the beginning place. And that is temptation. Temptation. Do you realize that if we can get a hold of the temptations that come to us and be overcomers in temptation, do you realize how much sin that we can avoid or not allow? within our lives, because temptation is the doorway. Temptation is the way in which it comes in. But if I am successful against temptation, and I'm not talking about never being uh, tempted, do you realize that that is a falsehood? To never experience temptation is a lie from Satan. It's a falsehood. It's an impossibility. So the scripture doesn't tell us never to come into contact with temptation, but it helps us to see what we are to do once we do come into contact with temptation. Because otherwise, if we never face it, 
we'll never have to overcome it, right? So what we're going to be looking at is the overcoming of temptation when it comes to the world. Go with me to 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 2. And as I said before, I like to look at these things in reality. And what I mean by that, there's a lot of teachings and instructions that we find in Scripture. But I like to see these things as it works in real life in people's lives, in the events that we have recorded uh, in Scripture. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7, starting. Peter says, and if he, that he is making reference here to God or to the Lord, if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensuous conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard, that righteous man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. So basically what we're seeing in this passage as we get started is that when it comes to this thing of temptation, we have many, many examples of people facing temptation, dealing with uh, temptation. In this particular instance, the writer says that Lot was rescued from temptation. Let's see if we can sort of uh, put ourselves where Lot was. Can you imagine living in Sodom and Gomorrah? from what we understand about those places and from what we understand what was going on. And here was a righteous family, according to what the scripture says, calls them righteous as leaves a couple of times. And here was a righteous family living in the midst of Sodom and Gomorrah and all the things that were going on and being affected in the, in the sense that they were being tormented by what they were seeing and by what they were hearing. Can you imagine going through your day, and you walk up on a scene that uh, what uh, Sodom and Gomorrah was involved in, and you just have to deal with it as best as you can. You have to detour your, your direction and go another way or whatever, however you decide to deal with it. Day after day, Lot was going through this. And the scripture says that he was tormented. But the scriptures also says that the Lord knows how to deliver or rescue the godly from temptation. You know what that tells me? No matter how hard we seek to uh, avoid the things that tempt us, and we should do our very best in, in what we do when it comes to temptation in order to avoid it. But no matter how hard we strive to avoid temptation, we're not going to avoid it all. Brethren, the answer to temptation that comes from this fallen world, the complete answer is not to avoid it. Now, Remember what I just said. We have to do everything that we are to, to do in order to avoid it. But somewhere along the line, you're going to come in contact with it. Somewhere along the line. We do the very best with our children, but we need to realize something. Somewhere along the line, they're going to leave our home. And once they leave our home, they're going to come in contact even more so with temptation than they have experience within our home? Have they been taught more than just simply avoiding it? I'm not downing avoiding it, but have they been taught to overcome it? Because if they have not been taught to overcome it, and they're not used to just simply avoiding it, it's going to sweep over them like a wave. When is the time that we lose most of our young people. Yeah, teenage years, but more so when they leave home. 
They get out on their own. They're making their own choices. They're making their own decisions and so forth. I have, I have had the opportunity to speak to a couple of young men, Christian young men who have grown up into Christian homes. And they share with me their difficulties at, at that stage of life. And the things that they faced, the things that they saw, the things that they encountered, and the ones that were successful in it, they had to fight that battle and have the determination within themselves I'm not going to take that route. And they have to. Somewhere along the line, it's going to have to become a personal decision on each and every person's occasion. But if they're, if they're not taught or trained uh, or know the, uh, understand what the Scripture says about overcoming temptation, then they're going to be quickly, very quickly, it's amazing how quickly they're going to be overcome. So this topic here is very important for us to give thought to and to really give consideration to of how this can be done. Now, what we're, what we're going to be looking at is how we can be vict, uh, victorious concerning temptation. Victorious concerning victa uh, uh, temptation. Now, before we go on, I need to put a face on this term of temptation. When we talk about temptation, once again, it's a very broad, it's a very broad uh, uh, picture that is painted. So let me sort of bring it down and break it down just a little bit. And I can't look at everything, but I want to look at three uh, quickly, three areas before we get into the heart of the message. What are we talking about when we're talking about temptation? In other words, what is a fallen world seeking to tempt me with? And I'm emphasizing the fallen world. Let's see if we can just simply look at uh, three quickly. I think you're going to recognize these. And these are the traps that your children are going to face, that you have faced, and that we're going to continue to face in some degree. The first one is sexuality. Do you realize that our world, this world that we are living in, has gone crazy? I don't know any other way to describe it. Has gone crazy when it has come to sexuality. How rampant is immorality? How many people do you know who is involved in, in immorality, sexual immorality? Has been. Yeah. Where did they get it from? It's coming from the world. They see it. They hear it. It's talked about. The world entices them to that, uh, to it, seek to draw them to it. And if they do not know how to overcome it, then they're going to fall to it. They're going to be overcome. See, God has given very simple directions when it comes to sexuality. He doesn't, does not condemn sexuality. He does not condemn the desires that a person has in that area because he created us like that. But the problem is when it is not used according to the instructions that God has given. And God's instructions is very simple. It is meant for and within the range of marriage only. Very simple. Only. There is no exception to that rule. But what does our world tell us? Our world tells us completely different. They have, the world places no limitations on sexuality in any way or form. And they're trying to find more ways in order to uh, uh, extend the limits that, are, that happen to be uh, uh, placed there. So sexuality is a, is, a, is a real temptation to all of us, no matter who we may be. No, I don't want it to be there, but it's there. It's there. The scripture tells us in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 3, once again quickly, it says, But immorality or any impurity or greed must not be named among you as is proper among saints. See, within God's people, it should not be a part, a part of us. This is not talking about, it should not be talked about. 
It mentions that it should not be found among us. Sexuality, but the world's temptation for it is there. A second thing that is very common and is that it's very relevant during our day and time, and we're seeing it more and more, we, we talk about it more and more, it is the addictions of our time. And you know, I don't know if this is normal or not or, or a common thing uh, in the days before me, but it seems like once again, uh, our world has gone crazy when it comes to addictions. People are strung out, we use the term, people are strung out on drugs. And you can even be more specific on the type of drug. They're, they're strung out on alcohol, they're dr uh, strung out on whatever they, the, the pills that they take, uh, all those different kinds. And I sort of understand the reason it's not a valid reason. It's because people are trying to deal with their life situation in a way, really, that they don't have to deal with it. So if I can numb myself for whatever period of time, then see, I don't have to worry about my troubles and, and the difficulties of life. But that's not God's answer. That's the world's answer. You know, people that, that are uh, involved in a life like that, they need Christ. That's the answer. Not some drug or get addicted to some uh, type of pleasure. That is not the answer. But nevertheless, this is what the world is telling us. This is what our fallen world is telling us and tempting us to. Here is a way that you can forget about your problems for whatever period of time you want. But they don't tell you about the downward spiral that gets a hold of your life and changes your life forever. So that's the second one. Now, the third one also a uh, temptation that is very prevalent during our day and time is when it comes to the world's uh, understanding of beauty. Of beauty. And this is also an enticement. Because the world tells us that in order to att be attractive, in order to use the word beautiful, then this is how you do it. The outward adorning is where it, where it is all is, according to the world. But please understand, there is a distinction between the world's beauty and what God has described. Amen. Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31, just quickly. We're not going to spend a lot of time here, but this is going to just start us off on, on the right foot. Proverbs 31, in verse 30. There it says, charm is de uh, deceitful and beauty is vain. Look at the word but. But, in other words, instead, instead of the charm and the beauty and giving the results of it or what it brings about, it says, but, or instead, a woman who fears the Lord shall be praised. I was looking at this word charm and trying to get an understanding of the meaning of it. And then uh, I was looking at it and it was bringing about charm dealing with, uh, you know, the portions that people use in order to uh, uh, be attractive to people on the various means. But more so the charms or the portions or the, uh, uh, the trinkets that people use. And I said, no, that's not the decoration. That's not the uh, definition I'm looking for. So I kept reading and it brings forth more so how people seek to be attract others or to charm others or to dazzle others, whatever words you want to use, that is what is involved in the meaning. But do you, do you see what the writer is saying here? And by the way, the one who said this was not a man. You read the context there. This is a mother writing to her son trying to get him to understand this area of life. That he would be aware of what is going on here. And she, knowing that she was inspired by God, but uh, uh, as she is writing it to her son, she says, charm is deceitful. How or why is it deceitful? Because it's not the real person. It's just as simply being used in order to attract someone and the amazing thing, once the attraction works, then the person becomes the real person. That doesn't sound right, does it? That sounds like it's cheating. You're not really getting what you thought you were getting. And it says, beauty, from the world's viewpoint, it's vain. What does vain mean? Empty. 
There's nothing there. Nothing there. The world tells us this is where it all lies. The world tells us that, hey, this is how you feel better or, or the best about yourself. The scripture says it's vain and it is empty. So if God is not looking for the external adornment, what is God looking for? Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3 quickly, once again. Quickly. 1 Peter chapter 3. Because we need to look at both sides of this, not just simply not what a person is supposed to do, but look at what God is looking for as well. 1 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 3. He says, your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses. We know that. Verse 4, it says, but, once again, in contrast, or instead of, not both, because you, both of them can't work this way. It's one or the other. He says, but, let me find my place. Okay, verse 4, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in whose sight? It's not going to be in the world's sight. The world doesn't care about the condition of a, of a person's heart. But this is precious in the sight of God. And you know what? As I think about it more and more as a man, Speaking from a man's viewpoint, I prefer the gentleness of a heart of a woman, my woman, my wife, than I do the external adornment. I will take it over and above it each and every time. Each and every time. Beauty is vain. It amounts to nothing. So these are some of the major areas that we are struggling with. These are temptations even to God's people. Why is it written in these letters if it was not a temptation for God's people? Do you think that who Paul or Peter was writing to had this all together? I don't think so. Otherwise, he wouldn't have written it. But he wrote it in order to bring it to their attention so that they would come in line to the things of God. But there's a lot of more temptations that can be uh, mentioned. But we can start to get a flavor, and we can start to get an understanding of what we're looking at. Now, what we want to look at or deal with uh, throughout this is how do we overcome these things? How can we be, be victorious over these temptations? We're going to face them on a regular basis. We're going to be tempted on a regular basis. We're going to be given reasons by the world, hey, this is the way that you should go. How can we be victorious? So let's, let's see if we can look at three things tonight to help us in this area. And the main thing that we're going to be considering is that God has told us how we can have the victory. I made a statement of the first two nights or the first two days, and I want to bring it to our attention again. Who or what or who would be the proper way of asking the question? Who is behind temptation? Let's hear it again. Who's behind temptation? Do we believe that? And the distinction that we made, Satan tempts in order to get us to do wrong, to get us to do the things that are against God. God tests in order to prove us. And we need to keep that principle before us. So we have to understand that someone is working against us in these areas. Someone is making sure that these temptations are before us with the hope, with the design, that these temptations will overcome us rather than we overcome them. Let me give you the simple answer, and then we're going to look at it more broadly, of how we are to deal with this. So uh, Ephesians, chapter elect, uh, Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6. And I want you to notice the passages that we're going to be reading because there is a word that you're going to find there on a regular basis. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. 
It says, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to, what's the word, what's the term? Stand, Stand firm against the schemes of the devil. That means that you are not giving ground. That means that you are not being overcome and standing firm. You go to uh, James chapter uh, 4 and verse 7. It says there, submit therefore to God and resist the devil and he will do what? Flee. Flee. If the devil flees, will the temptation remain? Uh, Satan is a source of temptation. So we are to stand firm and we are to resist. One more. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. It says, be sober of spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to, uh, to devour. And you know what? That's a scary picture. But, but, resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of sufferings are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. So see, these things of temptation is not uncommon for you. Never get the thought, I am the only one who has been tempted by these things. I am not, I'm the only one who are fighting these battles. The truth of it all is, all of us are battling these temptations that come to us in life. All of us are. I readily admit to you, I battle these things. I have to be an overcomer of this world. Just as anyone else does. The scriptures tell us that we're going to have to learn to resist. Now, if we learn to resist, let me give you a sports analogy. And a sports analogy is lifting weights. Anyone here ever lift weights? See, lifting weights is a, is a very good picture of, of a person resisting. Because you've got to take that weight the support of that weight upon yourself. And the resistance comes as you try to lift that weight. See, you're putting resistance against that weight. Now, in weight lifting, you may start out with a small weight, small amount. But if you're consistent in the lifting or the resistance of the weight, what happens? What happens? You become stronger. Please understand the picture. You get stronger. You start out with a certain amount. You can lift more. As you lift more and you work with that amount, you can lift more. This is what the picture or the scriptures is seeking to bring to our attention when it talks about resisting. If we will learn to resist Satan we will become strong in the areas of temptation where it doesn't bother us anymore. Where it doesn't entice us anymore. Where we can come to the point that we can walk by that temptation, even though it's there, we're not going to avoid it, but even though it's there, it's not going to bother him anymore. And it's going to become less and become less and become less and become less. But we have to learn how to resist. You know what that meaning of that word resist means? The meaning that it carries? It means to oppose. I like this one. It means to rebel. Now, wait a minute. I'm a Christian. I don't rebel. Yes, we do. Whether we're willing to admit it or not, each one of us have a certain amount of rebellion within us. Are you willing to admit that? Mm -hmm. Yes, we do. But usually we use that rebellion for the wrong. We rebel against the things that are right. And what the scriptures are seeking to tell us, use that rebellion that each one of us has and use it to oppose Satan. Satan. What would happen if that took place? If I was just as obstinate or just re as rebellious as I used to be, and hopefully it's not that way now, that I used to be to the things that are right and godly things, if I would turn that around and oppose Satan with that same intensity, 
How much victory would I have? He says, resist. Resist Satan, and he will flee. That's the answer. That's the overall answer. But I want to break it down just a little bit more. Because we also, in order to help us to overcome temptation, we also need to understand this thing of temptation. What is it? And how does it work? How does it work? James chapter 1 helps us in this understanding. What is temptation? And how does it work? James chapter 1, verse 13. James starts out by making this statement because he's seeking to correct uh, the thinking that a lot of people have. The people of his day had this thinking. A lot of people of our day have this thinking as well. So he starts out there in verse 13. He says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. Have you ever had that thought? Have you ever asked God, Lord, why are you tempting me? It doesn't come from God. Satan tempts, God proves. We have to keep that before us. So first of all, get, ready, get rid of the excuse that God is doing this to me. He's not when it comes to temptation. But then he goes on, uh, uh, James says, For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he does not tempt anyone. Mark that statement. Temptation does not come from God. Now he's going to explain us where temptation comes from. And you know what? You're not going to like it. But it's true. We look at verse 14. He says, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lusts. Hmm. That's a twist, isn't it? I thought you were going to say enticed by Satan. Well, Satan is involved in it, yes. But James is very clear. The reason that I struggle with temptation is that there are desires within me that whatever I am facing, I am attracted to those things. And the amazing thing is, a lot of times, those desires are natural and right desires that Satan seeks to exploit. He seeks for us to misuse. A lot of times there's nothing wrong with the desire. But Satan is trying to get me to go after what is wrong and to use these uh, desires in the wrong way. But it lies within me. It lies within me. I've used this illustration many times, and I may have used it here before as well. I am a person that likes very few vegetables. Very few. I don't care how you cook them. I don't care how you season them. I don't care how enticing you make them and you put them on the table before me. I will not touch them. I'm getting a little bit older now. For some reason, I'm getting soft on that. I don't understand that. But it's not an enticement to me. Because I have no desire. There's no desire within me. But there's other things that you put before me, and because of the desire that is within me, yes, it will be enticing to me. And I have to do whatever I need to do in order to control myself so that I will not uh, be enticed beyond what I should be or avoid it altogether if it's something that I am to avoid. So see, it starts with us. And if we can come to understand our desires, that's going to go a long way in helping us to overcome our desires. But here's the problem. A lot of times we deny it, our desires, and we tell ourselves they're not real. Please understand how God has made you. The, a lot of the natural de uh, desires, God has made you that way. But his desire is that you control your desires in such a way that they are not misused. So, what we're looking here at James is, and let me read it again, so that it'll stay with us. Verse 14, but each one is tempted when he is carried away 
and enticed by his own lust, then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. See, that's the process right there. And what we need to do is to come into this area when, it's, when it is dealing with our desires and do not allow our desires to carry us away or to draw us away. Not to allow our desires to control us, but we control our desires. And if we can get to that point, we can overcome temptation. And we can get to that point. Read uh, verse 14 out of the Amplified Translation. It reads like this. But every person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed and baited by his own evil desires, his lust or his passions. How many of us here are fishermen? Like to fish? I got to thinking about the definition of that word. And I realized something, or at least this is the way it helped me to understand it. To fish, I am Satan to them, using the analogy. Because I do to fish the very same thing that Satan do, does to me, or seeks to. Because in order to be good at fishermen, you learn to fish. You like what they like to, you, you come to understand what they like to eat. You come to understand where they hang out, right? And then what you do is I take my rod, I put on the, uh, on the bait what they like to eat, and I toss that out there where I think that they are, and what do I do? I slowly bring that bait, hoping that I bring it before a fish. And I don't know the complete perspective of a fish. The fish is probably looking around and saying, where did that come from? And I, once again, I don't know the perspective of a fish, but I think they make the fishing line where the fish cannot see it. All they can see is that little nugget of food there dangling it before them. And their thought is, all I have to do is take it and run. Probably not even run. Just simply take it. I... I'm Satan to a fish. Because that is exactly what Satan does to us. Do you realize that Satan has studied you? He is aware of your desires because we show what our desires are just by what we do. Do you know that Satan knows the things that we like? Do you realize that Satan even knows our weak points in life, our weaknesses? He's aware of that? You look at how he tempted Christ. He came to Christ at his weakest point in order to tempt him. You know that Satan knows where you hang out? He knows who your friends are, who you run with, who you see on a regular basis. And he knows how to use all of these circumstances in order to entice us and to tempt us, hoping we will grab on to what he has brought before us. And just like the fish, the fish doesn't realize there's a hook in it. There's a hook in it. And once you grab on to what Satan has enticed you with, He's going to begin to reel you in. Now, I've known a lot of fish that fight. And a lot of fish put up a, a real good fight. And we enjoy that fight, don't we? The more they fight, the more we say we had a, a good fishing time. But he slowly reels them in. Oh, he may let out a little line so he won't lose them. But once they tire out, he begins to bring them in again. As a fisherman, the analogy that I'm trying to paint I am Satan to the flesh. To help me to understand of how Satan operates with me. So therefore, I have to be on my guard. I have to understand myself as Satan understands me. 
I have to make sure that I'm in the right places to minimize the temptations. I have to make sure I run around with the right people once again in order to minimize the temptation. But I'm not going to avoid it all. So I'm going to have to learn how to deal with temptation. So temptation comes from us. And Satan does not play fair. He is going to use the things that appeal to me, that appeals to you. He does not play fair in order to, uh, to tempt us. He's going to use our natural God-given desires against us, if he can, in order to destroy us. What he uses, he will present as being good and innocent, but there is always going to be a hook in it somewhere. Watch out for it. Because if you take his bait, he's got you hooked. And he's going to try to draw you in. The second thing that will help us to overcome temptation is that Jesus tells us to pray that we may not be led into temptation. Turn over with me to uh, uh, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. As Jesus was teaching his disciples to pray, and if you're serious about temptation, we're going to have to have this practice as well. We're going to have to bring our situation before the Lord, and we're going to have to be open with our situation before the Lord. We cannot just simply try to hide what our desires are. We're going to have to come clean with God and say, Lord, I am being tempted in this area of sexuality, or I'm being tempted in this area of addiction, or I'm being tempted in this area of beauty, or whatever other area it may be. And we're going to have to ask him, request from him, petition from him that we would not be led into temptation. The sixth chapter of Matthew there, verse 9, Jesus says, pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debt as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but, or once again, instead, deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And here's my question. Have you you ever had a serious talk with your Lord, with your God, about the temptations that you're facing? Are you too ashamed? Are you too embarrassed just to admit that you're having, that you're being tempted by the various things? If we do not make this a matter of prayer, it's going to be very likely that we're not going to overcome. Because our strength comes from him. Our ability to overcome and to resist comes from him. So we're going to be, have to be honest with him about what we are experiencing. And from my experience, once I am open and honest before him, that is when the strength comes. That is when the overcoming comes. From my experience, when I try to hide it, when I try to deny it, when I try to overlook it, that is when temptation begins to overcome me. And I fall, and I fall, and I fall. It's not until I stand honestly before my Lord with my struggles and the enticements that come before me. We have to make it a matter of prayer. And there is no shame in experiencing temptation. 
Whenever I think about temptation, my mind usually goes back to Joseph, which was an Old Testament character, as we know. And I look at this young man as I read his account. And I have asked in time past, how did he do it? Because from a man's viewpoint, especially with Joseph, this must have been a very difficult temptation for him. See, Joseph was in his prime as a young man. He had the natural desires of a young man. And now he was being offered to have those desires satisfied. But it was in the wrong way. It was not according to what God, how God has designed it. Let's go back to uh, Genesis chapter 39. Genesis chapter 39, I just want to read a piece of it in order to bring it to our attention because this is an amazing thing. And it's going to bring out some points as well in how God deals with us when it comes to temptation. Now, I've made the point, let me state it once again here, that uh, somewhere along the line, we are going to come into contact with temptation. And if we have not been taught or if we have not been trained to overcome temptation, it's going to be an easy thing for us to give in to it. Apparently, somewhere along the line, Joseph had been taught because he does amazingly well. But Genesis chapter 39, starting in verse 6, it says, So he left everything he owned in Joseph's charge, that means Potiphar, uh, who uh, uh, Joseph's slave was, and with him... There he did not concern himself with anything except the food which he ate, meaning that Potiphar trusted Joseph. It says, now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance, and it came about after these events that his, uh, that his master's wife looked with desire, there go that word, temptation starting on her part, looked at him with desire, and it goes on, and she said, lie with me. But, look at the amazing thing. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold with me, here my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. He has put all that he owns in my charge. There is no one greater in this house than I, and he has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great, de uh, great evil against you? Against Potiphar? That was not his major concern. Against God. Amazing attitude. Where did he get this attitude to battle temptation in this way? To look at it as an offense against the God that he serves. But he goes on, or the story goes on. Verse 10. It says, as she spoke to Joseph day after day. You see how temptation works? See, we read this day after day things dealing with Lot. In other words, when temptation comes to us, it doesn't come to us at one, uh, one time and it's done. Temptation will come to you today. That same temptation may come to you tomorrow. That same temptation may come to you each day of the week. That temptation may still be there next month. That temptation may still be there next year. How am I going to deal with it? I'm constantly facing this temptation. We look at Joseph. Each and every time he was faced with the temptation, he said no. He says no. See, we talk about getting word, uh, uh, we're getting word down, where we're getting beaten down with the same old thing, and my uh, our resistance is getting less and less and less and less because I'm dealing with the same thing. If that wasn't that way with Joseph, each and every time this woman came to her, he said no. And when she tried to work the situation, where she thought that she had the advantage with Joseph. The house was empty. No one else was there. And there she was. And she was intent on getting what she desired. She grabbed him, caught onto his garment with the very same request. Lie with me. 
You know what Joseph did? He did not say, oh, well, I'm powerless now. No. He fled. Where and how did Joseph learn how to deal with temptation in this way? Day after day. And he did not give in. And many times we see people fail on the first try. We see people give in to temptation on the very first attempt of the temptation. What's the difference between Joseph and those who fail when it comes to temptation? We need to look at that question. Because Joseph is showing us temptation can be overcome. He had victory in this temptation. We can too. We can too. If we learn how to resist. And if we understand the temptation is coming from within me. Verse 12 says there in the account, she caught him by his garment, saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and went outside. See, to say, uh, Joseph was able to endure the temptation, no matter how intense, how intense it got. The third thing that's going to help us to, under, to uh, overcome temptation is that we have to have the understanding in the midst of the temptation, you have help. In the midst of the temptation, you have help. Hebrews chapter 2. Actually, before I get to that point, there's another point. Stay tuned on that one. I want to look at this one first. Uh, by understanding that you can escape from temptation. This is where I want to go from, uh, from this point. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is where we want to go. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We can overcome temptation by understanding that you can or that we can escape. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It says, therefore, let him think or let him who thinks he stands take heed does he, that he does not fall. In other words, if we think that we are so strong as a Christian, that we are so, God, uh, so close to God as a Christian, and I hope, so, hope that those things are, are the case, but if we get to the point to think that we're so close and that, we're, that we are standing that we cannot fall when it comes to temptation, that, that is at the point where Satan wants you, where, or he has you where he wants you. So even though we stand, we have to make sure that we do not fall. We look at verse 13. It says, no temptation has overtaken you, but such is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. See, this is how God works and helps us in a situation. See, our dealing with temptation is not uh, all about us. We have to remember at the time in the midst of our temptation that every temptation has a way of escape. Every temptation. When you are at your breaking point, when you think that, wait a minute, there's nothing that I can do except for to give in to this temptation, always remember, I have to begin to look around to see for, uh, look for the escape that God has provided because we're reading here, God has provided an escape. Where is it, though? And we have to look for it. For Joseph, it was just simply saying, knowing, going on about his business. When the time came, 
He just said no, and he fled. And you remember what happened after he fled? We know uh, his, his uh, Potiphar's wife came in, started crying to him, uh, accusing Joseph of what he did, or accused him of what he did, and, and Potiphar put him in jail, prison. Was that God's way of escape for Joseph? Think about it. He was no longer in that situation. Think about it. So we have to be serious when we ask that God will help us when it comes to temptation. See, you may, you may lose your job if you have a temptation there that's battling against you spiritually. And if you're serious about it and you're asking for the, the help from God, asking for the way of escape, it may mean you have to find another job. You may lose some friends. If you're serious about temptation and you're serious about your relationship with God, you may have to uh, cut off the relationship with those friends. I mean, there could be a, a lot of different consequences because you're looking for the way of escape. And the way of escape that God said that he will provide. But you know what we usually do? Lord, take the temptation away. And here we read that we are to endure it. It is to be endured. Being endured means that it's there. For a period of time anyway, it's there. And our God will provide ways of escape. Let's go and look at the third point. How can we overcome temptation? By understanding that we have help in the midst of temptation. I just want to look at two passages on this. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17. And these two passages, they are amazing passages because, once again, it brings us back to Christ. And it brings us back to what Christ was willing to do or is willing to do on our behalf. Verse 17 reads like this. He says, therefore, he, making reference to Christ, he had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Now, one of the excuses that we give when it comes to temptation, uh, also according to a lot of things, is even uh, before God, we can come before God and say, Lord, you just don't understand. You don't understand how hard it is. You don't understand how difficult it is. You don't understand what I am facing. Can we truly say that? That is not true. He does understand. You know why he understands? Because he has experienced, he has been tempted, the scripture uses the word, he has been tempted in all ways in which we are tempted. He took on man, being fully man, with all of the natural desires that we have. He knows what those natural desires are. He knows the temptation from a fallen world that comes with those natural desires. And each and every time, he said no. But he had those experiences so that he would know how to work with us. So that he would know how to come to our aid. So that he would come to know how to help us. Do we give him the opportunity to help us in our time of temptation because he does understand. No, he's not going to give you leeway to, to uh, be overcome by the temptation. He's going to remind you, you can be an overcomer. Don't let this thing get the best of you. Keep fighting it. Keep resisting. As you resist, you're becoming stronger and stronger and stronger. You don't have to give in. We have to come to understand 
what we have in Jesus Christ being our high priest. He is there for us. And he understands. One more passage. Also in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 14. Talking about Jesus, the high priest, once again, we have to understand him in this capacity. He says, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. What weaknesses are he talking about? Yeah. See, he does understand. Not only does he understand, he sympathizes. It goes on, it says, But one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin, therefore, or because of this, let us draw near with, uh, near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The next time that you are faced with a temptation, and you're fighting it, you're battling it, you do not want to be overcome by this thing. Maybe it has gotten the best of you before, but now you're making the determination, I am going to take a stand. I'm not going to allow it to overcome me anymore. And the next time that you are in that battle, remember Christ, that, there, that he is there for you. And remember Christ, he has faced that temptation. And remember Christ, he will provide a way for you to escape. And even more so, remember Christ. He is there to aid you in the midst of your temptation. Now, here's my, what I mean by that. I'm not talking about come, coming to Christ after you have been overcome by the temptation, looking for his mercy and grace. No, do it before that. Come to the throne of Jesus Christ, seeking his mercy and his grace as you are in the midst of the temptation. While the battle is going on, it will be even more so uh, before you even face the temptation. That you would ask the Lord for strength and the ability to overcome. How are we doing when it comes to temptation? I know in this area, there is failure after failure after failure, after failure, with a lot of people, with a lot of people. And this is the doorway for sin to enter into our lives. If we can close that door, close that door, and if it's not closed completely, close it uh, some, as much as we can so that less can get in, and more and more so less and less can get in. But we close that door, then we will be rooting sin without our lives. It is our lust that carries us away and entices us, which brings about sin, and sin brings about death. Our song tonight is number 111. Number 111. This song says, lead us, or uh, yield not to temptation, actually. And this song has some amazing words. And as we sing, I would like for you to give thought to these words. And we're going to sing two verses of this song, the first and the second verse of this song because of the words. Because this song encourages us as well in this area. Just once again, admonishing us, don't give in. Don't yield. Continue to resist. Use that rebellion within us as we face the battle. 
of temptation. Let us be standing, and we're going to be singing verse number one and two of 111.